of CNC. Uh, this is not the evolution of cookies and cream because, I mean, honestly, where do you go from here? It's the ice cream of the future, but we have it today. <laughs> this is not the evolution of Coheed and Cambria, although uh, they've got a number of albums that progress through the years in interesting ways. I know we're talking about command and control today, um, although I don't, I don't know what it has to do with uh, nuclear missiles, but uh, this was the best picture I could find. Like I said, uh, my name is John Askew, I'm not the trance DJ from the UK, although I am somewhat of a fan. Uh, I'm just a guy uh, from right here in Kentucky, been doing penetration testing and red teaming stuff for going on 12 years now. I still consider myself a beginner. The more I learn, the more I realize I don't know hardly anything. So I'm always trying to learn more. I also enjoy writing software, and that's part of why I'm here today. Some stuff that I've played around with. And a quick disclaimer, these are my statements, not positions or views of any clients or employers. So uh, I'm really honored to be speaking here today in front of you all. This is a really big room. Um, I'd like to give you a, a quick uh, overview of what we're going to be talking about for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. I'm going to break it into three different parts. First, we're going to do a brief history of command and control. And it's not really a chronological history. It's more, I'll be kind of cherry picking some different command and control methods and talking about how capabilities change and evolve between them from the past through what's, what do we use today most commonly and then looking towards the future what, uh, what things are we going to be seeing from command and control uh, going forward? Uh, second, with that you know, forward-thinking view, how can we increase red team capabilities? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, capabilities and, and uh, maturity and um, hierarchy of needs and what, uh, what are the ways that we can advance these capabilities uh, into the future. Uh, and then lastly, uh, from a blue team perspective, I'm not uh, very much of a blue teamer, but uh, I, I want to talk about how we mature our uh, detection and response in kind with these uh, new uh, potential capabilities. Uh, how do we detect those and respond to them? Uh, and I think there are a few interesting things from, from some research that will potentially be useful to that effect. So, to start off, let's, let's go over just a brief definition of command and control, what we're talking about today. Uh, the MITRE attack framework gives a really good working definition here. Uh, it's a tactic which, in, and I'm sure you've heard about uh, MITRE attack framework this weekend from multiple other talks, but you've got a hierarchy of tactics, techniques, and procedures or processes. And this is a tactic, so a high-level thing, uh, that represents how adversaries communicate with systems under their control within a target network. So basically, when an attacker gains access to a host or system, how do they retain control of that host remotely over a, a given time period? There's other related components. Um, you know, how, how do you get that payload on the system? Do you use stagers? Uh, how do you persist your, your control? How, how do you make sure that, that that malware continues to run? And then post-exploit modules, all the fun stuff that you can do while you have access. Uh, we're not really going to talk much about those. I'm going to try to focus just on the communication channel aspect because uh, that's more than enough to cover an hour's time. A few other concepts I want to cover before we dive in. Capability is something I'm going to repeatedly say. Uh, basically, the ability to perform or achieve certain actions or outcomes. In offensive security, uh, we can use this to describe the extent of what an adver adversarial threat actor can achieve uh, during an attack and specific to command and control uh, I think we'll be talking about capabilities along several different axes or, or ax aspects uh, like reliability, security, concealability. On the flip side you've got this idea of constraints. So attackers and defenders both operate under a number of constraints which are limits that are placed on those capabilities. Uh, these can be general um, that, that that apply to you know your your blue team as a whole or your red team as a whole. How many how much time resources personnel do you have to be able to do research and to be able to develop things? Uh, more specifically, uh, we've got situational constraints uh, like attack surface. 
you know, uh, in a particular environment that you're attacking, what does the attack surface look like? What are the, the firewall rules and the endpoint controls and all these other things that are going to influence your decision on what command and control method to use and what will, will work in those situations. And also situational awareness, being aware of that environment of, of what's going on and, and knowing, uh, you know, what the, what is being looked for, uh, th th those kind of things are also going to affect how you decide to do command and control. And so you got capabilities and constraints that are kind of playing against each other. So let's jump into a brief history of command and control. And this is going to be more like a narrative than, a, than actual history. But um, once upon a time, there's a buffer overflow in Bob's network server. I guess it was the 90s, and it was cool to not you know, check your bounds in memory. So um, we got a vulnerability. Uh, Alice finds this vulnerability. She wants to exploit it. Uh, but she didn't want to commit to a specific payload up front. She liked the ability to kind of retain control and decide what she wants to do over over a period of time. Maybe send some commands, receive a response, and then decide. You know, from there, um, make make some new decisions on what to do. So, Alice made a bind shell. So I guess the bind shell is probably the one of the simplest types of command and control you can you can think of, right? You got malicious software that opens up a port on your target system, and then your attacker can connect directly to it and get uh, a shell. You can you can send commands, you get responses back, and life is good. You can make that target do your bidding. So that's great. Now we have something we didn't have before. Uh, we've increased our reliability. Uh, we've also increased our agility. We got some flexibility to send a command, receive a response, and then based on what that response is, we can we can make other decisions of different commands to send. Uh, maybe we've decreased security a little bit by opening a port on. Uh, a target network that someone else can connect to, but we'll ignore that for the time being. But there's some problems with the bind shell too. It's it's definitely not the 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 end all of command and control, right? There's situations that this is just not going to work for us. In particular, you know, you've got firewall rules. Um, anybody that's ever done an external penetration test or or a red teaming exercise where you're trying to gain a foothold on an internal network, you're probably going to do some kind of phishing. You're probably going to try to, to exploit endpoints, which are inside of a corporate network, inside of a perimeter firewall. And those firewalls have uh, ingress rules and, and that and all this other stuff that prevents you from going from the internet directly in, into their network. So mind shell is no go for something like phishing, right? But that's OK, because now we have the reverse shell, uh, which is a reverse connection. Am I, am I reading that right? OK. Uh, that's that's the joke that everybody likes that. Yep. Uh, so a reverse shell is almost the exact same thing as a bind shell, except uh, the connection starts in reverse. Instead of opening up that port, the target is going to connect back to the attacker. And then at that point, the connection is established. You can shuffle those bytes back and forth, send commands, get responses. Life is good. You can make the target do your bidding. So we've increased our capabilities, right? Yay, weak egress filtering. Because this is going to work in a lot more scenarios because egress filtering in, in corporate environments is generally a lot weaker than ingress filtering. There's usually some way out of environment. Or at least it's a lot easier to get out than it is to get in. So we've increased our reliability. It's working in a lot more situations that, that are useful to us. Uh, and you know we've, we've maybe slightly increased security and concealability and some other things as well. But mainly, we've got that increased reliability, which is cool. Um, so. Reverse shell is great. We can all go home, right? Now, now this this is there's still some some constraints here because um, their egress filtering does exist, so you might have to pick the right port to go out. Maybe they blocked all ports from the the particular host you want to compromise, so it, it can't just get out at all. Um, and this is not a particularly stealthy method, right? It's just a, a raw, you know, probably TCP connection between two IP addresses. It's just shuffling bytes back and forth that have commands and command responses in them. Maybe you've got some encryption, but it's it's not something that's necessarily going to blend in well with, with uh, under a high amount of scrutiny. So, um, oh, and, and there's one other thing, potential attribution. So you've got this payload that's connecting back to an IP address on the Internet. Uh, whenever that gets detected, you know, that IP address uh, is going to be associated with this this campaign and so um, 
you can start associating that with other things, and, and it's more information for an investigation to, uh, to, to uh, use. So what's, what's the next thing after reverse shells? Well, you know, let's just, yeah, IRC channels. Everybody loves IRC channels, right? So this was actually something that was really popular for botnets uh, in the uh, early 2000s. There may still be some that use IRC, I don't know. For those of you who don't know what IRC is, it's Internet Relay Chat. It's what Slack was like 10 years ago. So if you know what Slack is, it's, it's like that, but, with, but like at a terminal, like with the dark background. Yeah. Um, so um, people started using IRC channels to send their command and control messages. And this is nice for a number of reasons. But the way it works is your targets join an IRC ser server, they connect to an IRC server, they join a channel, and they listen for commands. And your attacker connects to that same channel, types the commands out, and those get broadcast to all of your, your targets, which then can execute the commands. So it's, it's uh, a little bit more sophisticated than a reverse shell for a number of reasons. So first of all, we have moved from a raw network layer up to a protocol layer. We're using the IRC protocol, not just raw TCP. Um, so there's, there's some you know, increased reliability with that because um, protocols are more likely to be allowed. If, if, if they're in use in your target environment, then a protocol uh, may be more likely to be allowed to connect out to the Internet. Um, we've also increased our uh, concealment, concealability, um, because if presuming that there's other IRC traffic on your network, then this can potentially blend in, right? So this is great. We've got uh, an IRC shell, or IRC command and control method. But there are some problems as well. Um, namely, in 20 2018, that's the year it is, right? 2018, um, I don't think many people are, are actually using IRC. Is anyone using IRC? There's a few. Uh, but is is anybody's uh, work using IRC for business purposes? Not not a lot. So uh, this is likely to stand out in a lot of places that, that we would want to use it, potentially. It's likely to be blocked and detected. Not only for the fact that it's unusual, but also for the fact that for a decade or more, we had lots of botnets using this. So we got a lot of, a lot of scrutiny. But I like this idea of tunneling through protocols, right? So are there other protocols that we can tunnel through? Sure, we can, we can do just about anything, right? You know, you've got ICMP, uh, which you can tunnel through, but it's, it's kind of slow and, and kludgy. Um, you can, you can send stuff through SMTP, but email's kind of complicated. I don't really want to get into that can of worms. Um, we can just use raw UDP. Um, there we go. I, I, the, 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 you know, everybody's favorite UDP joke. I tell you, but you might not get it, uh, and I, I wouldn't care if you did. <laughs> but there is uh, one, or actually two, but one protocol in particular that turns out to work really well, and that's DNS. So, and, and we're we're here in the modern age now. This is this is stuff that that everybody's using. Um, DNS tunneling uh, works well for command and control for a number of reasons. Um, the two biggest I can think of is one, it's very ubiquitous. You know, you can't have the internet without DNS. You have to be able to resolve names to IP addresses to get anywhere. Um, so every, so DNS is, is necessary and it's going to be on every network. Uh, it's also got its own built in routing, right? DNS is recursive, so you, uh, you make a query. You don't have to query your, your attacker server. You can query your local DNS server and then it will recurse to another one, to another one, to another one, and it'll eventually get back to your um, malicious DNS server uh, through the magic of DNS. It's built right into the protocol, which is great. Uh, so we've got high reliability uh, because those two reasons that I just stated, and also concealment because DNS is everywhere, right? So great. Uh, we can all go home? No, uh, because... Actually, it turns out if you're looking for uh, DNS, if you're, if you're doing DNS inspection, it's, it's 
fairly detectable. Uh, and there's ways to hide it, but um, you know, it's it, it in most cases it, can, it tends to be obvious when when you're using DNS for command and control, unless you're being very very careful about it. So uh, so in fact, it, it does serve a use for. Um, well, I won't get into that yet. Uh, let's let's move on to one other protocol, um, and and wrap things up on the history. Um, HTTP uh, is a, is the other, well, probably the most popular method for command and control. Um, not least of which because it's the most common protocol on the internet. Um, and its use in command and control tends to be mostly uh, building a custom HTTP server and a client and then doing some type of polling or beaconing out to that server. Um, so you build your HTTP request payload and you encode your commands into URLs or uh, headers or uh, parameters. You send it and you do the same thing in the HTTP response. You encode those command and control commands within that protocol, that HTTP protocol. And you can even get very, you can get a lot of flexibility with this. There's uh, a thing that's commonly referred to as malleable C2 profiles, where you can tweak all those parameters, right? You can, you can say, I want to make the URL look a certain way, and I want to make the headers look a certain way, and I want to make the post parameters look a certain way, and, and make it behave like this in such a manner to, to simulate, um, particular websites or, or things like that. So we've got a, a high reliability and concealability just from the fact that HTTP is used everywhere and you've got a lot of flexibility with, with malleable profiles. Um, you've also got this, this idea of resilience where we've gone from a stateful, like a synchronous connection, like a TCP connection or something like that, to something that's stateless. You've got a request and response. And then you can, you know, wait five seconds and do another request and response. Or you can wait an hour, or you can wait a day, or whatever. But there's no, you don't have to have a constant connection. And you've also got other infrastructure like proxying that that helps make it more resilient to um, to failure. So these are all good things to have in a command and control protocol and uh, help us out a lot. There's still some constraints. Um, in particular, if you're setting up a HTTP command and control server, you're going to put it on some IP or domain or at some URL, and once it's discovered that that thing is going to allow you to tie it back to other things. Uh, so uh, there's that, but then I want to talk about this other concept that many of you may be familiar with, domain fronting, which is not a command and control method per se, but it can be used effectively with HTTP to mask your, your actual destination and avoid blocking because uh, when you do this, um, and I don't, I don't really have time to go into the technical details of how this works, but connections go to an actual cloud load balancer or something like that, so it looks like it's actually going to Amazon or Google or somewhere, uh, and then on the back end it gets routed to your actual uh, malicious command and control server. And um, this used to be possible with Google and Amazon CloudFront, um, but both of them uh, earlier this year supposedly um, fixed that issue. Um, it may still be possible to do with uh, Microsoft's network, and th there's lists on, on GitHub of, of potential uh, domain fronting domains that you can you can test out. So this is is still a legitimate uh, way to mask your command and control traffic, but uh, definitely took a hit by um, Google and Amazon eliminating it. So you can get really, really close to looking like actual legitimate traffic with HTTP and domain fronting and, and some of these profiling things, but there's nothing quite as good as the real thing, right? So um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, apps and third-party services. So We've seen a lot of, more recently, uh, a lot of command and control traffic utilizing specific applications or third-party services. We've seen one-off tools and POCs that have been created for specific services. Uh, we've seen some tools add 
external command and control plugin capabilities where you can write a, write a plugin to use a specific method or service and add it in. And there's definitely been used by real world threats. So um, this is something where um, by, by going from looking like, you know, uh, Google Cloud Platform traffic to being actual Google Cloud Platform traffic increases our concealment and also increases our reliability. Um, some constraints there. Uh, situational awareness, so if you're going to use something like this, you need to be aware of what your target is using, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, and there's some, probably some other constraints with it as well, but this is kind of um, where I want to focus a little bit on the, the future of command and control. And, um, how, how we'll be using more of these third-party channels. So I'd say it's, it's likely that all these methods will continue to work in some cases, particularly opportunistic attacks. And in fact, you know, if a bind shell or a reverse shell is going to work for you in a particular situation, then you might as well use that instead of doing something more advanced, given your, your situation and your constraints you're operating under. Hopefully, we're going to see mature organizations continue to improve their capabilities um, for detecting and preventing a lot of these methods. Uh, and there's tooling out there that exists up to a certain level, I believe. But um, on the red team side, if we want to be able to succeed against these mature organizations, we're going to need to blend more and more into that legitimate traffic as much as possible. And that's going to include those third-party channels. So the next thing I want to talk about is how we take this and we start to increase those capabilities. So some of you may be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the idea of a person being uh, having a, a number of needs and they have to be met in a certain order, like the foundational ones before you move up the, the pyramid. So there's no point in, in worrying about a seam if you can't eat today, right? Uh, and then there's also this, uh, which has nothing at all to do, I think, with, with the hierarchy of needs, but... Uh, I like Parks and Rec. Um, but I think, I think it'd be useful to talk about command and control from a red team perspective in a hierarchy of needs. So you've got these different capabilities or different, different aspects of capabilities that I've been talking about, like reliability and security. And I think, you know, those at the bottom, reliability and security are probably the, 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 the most foundational of, of these. Um, you've got to have something that works that, that accomplishes your goal. Uh, and then, and then, well, here, let me just jump into one at a time. We need something that's reliable, right? We need something that, that can deliver our messages, our command and control messages. We need something that works not just in the lab, but, but out in the field. And we need, at the same time, something that's going to be secure. Um, because if, uh, if we're introducing vulnerabilities into a client's network, as part of a, a penetration test or a red team engagement, then that's a, that's a huge problem, right? We don't want to make them less secure. We want to make them more secure. So security is important. Uh, and so thinking about the needs for, for a uh, command and control framework, we've got to think about encryption and authentication. So in particular, um, TLS is, is not enough today. Um, not every single organization out there is doing man-in-the-middle inspection of TNF, TLS, but enough are that it should just be assumed. Um, and we should make this, this security built in and as simple and foot gun free as possible because we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot. Which I, want, I don't know what a foot gun would actually look like. I'm thinking... Uh, Okay, so we also need, moving up that pyramid from, from, yep, reliability and security. Uh, next thing I had in here was concealment. Uh, we want to be able to uh, avoid detection for at least some minimum period of time against some level of detection capabilities, right? It's gotta, it's gotta work long enough for us to, to get the job done. Um, if they figure it out, you know, two weeks later or six months later, it may not be as big of a deal, but we, we need it to, to at least conceal ourselves long enough to achieve our goal. Uh, beyond that, we want resilience. We want something that's going to operate uh, 
and continue to operate in the face of unexpected outages. So I'm sure no one's ever had a shell just disappear for no reason in the middle of an engagement, right? Uh, if, if we can build redundancy in, then, then uh, that can help us out there. Uh, and then on top of that is agility. We want to be able to adapt. We want to have flexibility to adapt to new and unexpected needs because, you know, unexpected things happen in pretty much every engagement. And not only be able to adapt, but be able to adapt quickly. So if we can build a build tools and, and frameworks that allow us to do that easily, then we're going to be that much better off. And then you got features at the top, which are like icing on the cake, I guess. Like, remember the old food pyramid? You had what, sugar at the very top? That's what that is. So, yeah, resilience. I'm going to repeat myself here. Sorry, slides got a little bit out of order. Um, expect messages to be lost and still operate. Expect some network traffic to be blocked or modified and still operate. And try to learn from other software engineering disciplines. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff out there on message passing and on consensus and things like that. We don't have to get too advanced, but, but there's some things we can pick, pick up there and apply to our tools. Yeah, agility in, in particular would be nice if we can plug in uh, new transport mechanisms during engagements. So we realize that a, um, a target is using a particular uh, service and we can adapt that service to our needs in the middle of the engagement. That'd be nice. Okay, so uh, I started writing some, some code. Um, and I, I called this thing Hyperwave for, for whatever reason. Uh, it's, a, it's a framework for decentralized messaging over the Internet. Uh, basically, message passing um, that can be used as part of a command and control framework. And uh, the, the code will be posted there on Bitbucket, uh, hopefully later today or tomorrow. Um, I've tried to, uh, thinking about these needs, I, I tried to think about how you would build something that would, that would meet a lot of these needs. Uh, and this is in no way a completed uh, concept, but um, some things that I tried to to um, lead with were using some functional programming principles where you build larger things from, from small pieces, kind of like Legos, building a big Lego thing, um, because it gives you a lot of flexibility. You can rearrange those, those Legos. Um, wanted to do something that's decentralized uh, and have first-class routing built in uh, because uh, and, and move a, a little bit away from a client server model because you could still model a client server with a, a decentralized network but it gives you more more of that flexibility and I wanted to have pluggable transports uh, so that you could you can change things out use use different types of of channels uh, within the same framework again, for, the, for that flexibility and adaptability. So I'll just go over a few things about the architecture. Um, at a high level, there's a concept of an address, uh, which is a unique identifier, kind of like an IP address. Um, currently, it's represented as a, as a UUID for value. But every, every peer in the network has a unique address. Um, you can't have a, a message passing framework without messages, right? So this is this atomic element of communication from one peer to another. Uh, and the message is basically a combination of a header and a body. The header is that metadata that the framework uses. And then the body is whatever the implementation decides to use. So you, you, uh, you can make that whatever you want. Uh, then there's this concept of an envelope, which is uh, the encrypted message uh, plus the minimum amount of metadata that you need to, to handle and deliver that message within the framework. Uh, right now, that metadata includes a destination address, which allows you to, to relay and deliver, ultimately, the messages, and some type of identifier for each individual message that allows you to, to track those. And then a transport, which is the mechanism for asynchronously sending and receiving uh, those envelopes. So these are, generally speaking, services that can be used and abused for ad hoc message queuing. And this is kind of where that 99-ish that 
number comes in from the, uh, the, the very beginning of the talk, the title. Uh, now don't get too excited because th not all these things are necessarily um, available right now for, for use, but uh, the general concept is you can take a lot of these different services and plug them in interchangeably and still get your, your messages delivered. And you'll take um, an envelope and, and be able to embed it inside a Base64 text body or a, a JPEG file or an MP3 or other different types of, of formats that these different services can natively utilize. And going down this route, I found there's a few, few interesting benefits to, um, to looking at things in this way. So one example here is transitivity. So say you got, you build this, this hyperwave network, you've got three peers. Um, none of them can connect directly to each other. Let's just say peer one is our command and control server. And peer two is like a workstation on uh, a target network. Um, that can get out to the internet and can, in fact, reach Dropbox. So you can use this framework to send messages through Dropbox to, to peer number two. So now they can communicate. And then peer three is actually blocked completely from the internet, but they both have, both peer two and peer three have access to a uh, CIFS file share. So um, we can use that to, to relay messages between two and three. And then by transitivity, which is uh, just, I guess, a pretentious way of saying routing, um, you can send messages between peer one and peer three. And I'm actually gonna, gonna show a demo of this specific example in a second. Uh, example number two uh, is redundancy. So another thing we kind of get for free by approaching things from this way is um, you, you can have redundancy. So we've got peer one and peer two, and they can both connect to uh, S3 bucket of some sort, and they can both connect to Google Drive. So we can have them use both methods to relay messages back and forth. And then if one goes down, then you can have failover through the other one, which is something that would be useful in an engagement, right? To have, you always want to have multiple ways so you're not, you're not out of luck if one goes down. So I was going to try to do a live demo, but I have no internet access. So I did make a video and, um, Unfortunately, it seems like the live demo is not as common as it used to be. I kind of missed that. But here's a here's the thing I recorded this morning when I did have internet access. Um, so, uh, and to preface this, um, so there's the framework, and then I wrote a little implementation of an implant and a um, and like a server, so that I could I, I could actually do something with it. Uh, so this, in this situation, I've got two implants running on Windows machines um, that can both reach a file share, like in that first example, and then I've got uh, one running here on my Mac that can, can hit Dropbox. And so, let me just play this. So what we're going to see is, I'm starting it up. What's going on? It's getting cut off. I'm sorry. Let me try it a different way. Drag it over. It's almost as bad as a live demo, right? Yeah, it's doing it there too. All right, is that big enough? Can you all see that? Drag it. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, sorry about that. All right. So running the console here. We've got a console. Uh, and we've got two peers that, the, that, that our, our console is aware of. They're both those big U, UID blobs. We're going to send a shell command to that guy. And it's actually going to route through the other guy first. So we're going to go to Dropbox, and then the other peer is going to pick it up from Dropbox and relay it through 
SMB file share, and then the reverse is going to happen to send the response. And I'll drag it. I'll try to drag it up. This is getting kind of slow. So we got back a. We did a who am I? And we got back user. Real exciting, right? So let's do something a little bit more interesting. We'll do a directory listing. List uh, C colon backslash. And there's about an 18 second round trip because we're pulling Dropbox every nine seconds. Well, I guess the max would be 18 seconds depending on how the wind is. The line. So in a second we'll see we get back a directory listing. There we go. So it worked. That's good. And that was not a live demo, that was a video, but I appreciate the applause anyway. I mean, I had a hard enough time getting the video to work, so I can't even imagine what it would have been like <laughs> otherwise. Cool. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about operational concerns, um, things you've got to think about if you, as a red teamer, are going to use these different third-party channels. Um, in particular, each, each channel is going to have its own concerns, but there's also uh, credential handling concerns that, that are more general. It, with, with each service that you, you're going to use, you know, if it, like Dropbox for instance, I, I wrote an implant that used a connection to Dropbox, so obviously I had to embed some type of credentials in that implant, and then once that implant gets reverse engineered, those credentials get discovered. You want to make sure that whatever credentials you give it are as, as sandboxed and as limited as possible so that, that uh, you, you limit what can happen once once that burning occurs. Um, yeah. And then I really need to get back into to the this last part. Make sure I have enough time. Um, so, talking about a little bit about uh, increasing red team capabilities. How do we mature our detection and response in kind? Uh, we definitely want to start anything at a fundamental level. Um, adversarial threats, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, will use the minimum capabilities necessary to achieve their goal, right? Uh, if, if all you need is a reverse shell, then why do some kind of fancy Dropbox stuff um, if, if the reverse shell will work? So it's important that we, on the defensive side, address less mature methods first. Make sure that, that we've got those fundamental things, and I'm, like I said, I'm not an expert on the, the blue side, but um, there's a lot of things that, that are more fundamental at the network and protocol lever, layer that uh, we need to look at uh, and, and think about reducing our attack surface. Um, that picture's still in there. I thought I took it out. Okay, uh, but what, what I really want to talk about in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is... Um, this application layer. And so as, as, I've, as I've looked at tunneling, command and control, traffic through a bunch of different types of services, there's some commonalities um, that, that you see. Um, so if we're trying to detect that abuse of uh, applications, um, it's, it's kind of dependent upon the specific application that you're looking at as to how you would detect abuse. Because um, each, each service is di very different. Um, and we're, we're talking now about something above the network layer and above the protocol layer. We're more like an application layer. So um, some of these can be very challenging to, to dis thank you can to be very challenging to discriminate between um, legitimate and malicious usage. And the tools that exist today that I'm aware of, um, the, the, the commonly deployed tools, uh, don't have that granularity to look within the application to make determinations about whether this is a good use of Dropbox or a bad use of Dropbox. It may just be allow Dropbox or block it. So how can we do a little bit better than that? And I want to go through uh, 10 ways to detect abuse of using these services for command and control. Um, these are general principles. 
uh, that should be kind of adapted to your specific needs. Um, there are a mixture of specific artifacts you can look for in requests and more general application behaviors. And um, most of these will require that TLS inspection to look within, within your HTTP traffic, um, but that's something we kind of assume. And these are not like a top 10 or even the best 10 or anything like that. It's just 10, 10 things that I've that, that have come up as I've been looking at doing this. Uh, the first one's probably the easiest, unused services. So when somebody says, we don't use that here, uh, that's probably a red flag, right? Um, so you got an organization, say you use uh, everything AWS. You're, you're all about AWS, all in. And you see uh, something going to Google Cloud Platform one day. Uh, that's an easy way to, to throw a red flag, right? Uh, maybe even, you know, be, block all traffic to uh, Google Cloud if you're not using it in the enterprise. Um, but at least you should should be able to detect it. That's an easy way to raise a red flag. Uh, I didn't really talk at all about endpoint type controls today, but this this one's just too good to pass up. Um, looking at correlation between processes and traffic, um, you can see stuff like you know LSAS study XE should never be connecting to, to weird ser uh, third party services, right? Uh, that's, that's a given. And th that might seem a little silly, uh, and hopefully a, a sophisticated attacker would not be doing something like that, but the, the point is that attackers make mistakes, and so you need to be ready for when those mistakes happen and be able to, to catch that, that one thing and then start that investigation. Uh, unique domain activity. Uh, so a lot of these services, like S3, for instance, have unique uh, domain names associated with accounts or associated with with particular uh, buckets, for instance. So if you know that your environment uses these 10 S3 buckets for for prod and for uh, your dev environment, then you can easily whitelist those and alert on others that you see uh, through you know DNS uh, queries or through HTTP traffic. Uh, unique URL paths, URL parameters. So similarly, um, something like uh, Amazon's SQS, uh, Simple Query Service. So those queue names show up in the URLs. If you know what specific queues uh, that you use, then you can whitelist those and you can alert on ones that aren't on that whitelist. And these are just examples like SQS, but there's a lot of other services that have um, unique things in the URLs. There's a lot of other services that have unique domain names like Slack. Every every Slack um, workspace has its own unique subdomain off of Slack.com, and uh, Sharefile does the same thing. So these are these are broad principles um, dependent upon what uh, services you're looking at. Uh, headers are another good place to look. Uh, user agent, agent mismatches. Uh, is a great place to to look for um, differences. Uh, so certain uh, applications use particular user agent headers, and you know attackers may, can know that as well. But uh, it's a good place to look for for potential abuse. Um, and uh, there are application specific headers that you can look for as well. The presence or absence of which may indicate. Um, a legitimate application versus something that's trying to pose as a legitimate application. Uh, authentication uh, is a good place to look. Um, with these these API keys, these OAuth tokens. Um, like when when I'm using Dropbox earlier, I've got a static API key that I use for all the implants, um, which is going to look a little bit different than actual use of Dropbox, where clients will all have unique uh, API keys. So if you're seeing the same API key coming from 10 different workstations, then that's something that should arouse suspicion. And sometimes, even over time, like you've got those keys rotating. Um, so if you see a static key, one hour, two hour, five hours, that hasn't been rotated, then that can, that can be a good place to, to look as well, to, to raise a red flag. Um, behaviors, 
uh, which APIs are being used, how they're being used. A lot of these services offer multiple APIs that can do some of the same things. Uh, so the, the ones that you decide to use in your application versus somebody else's can allow you to differentiate. Um, and the order in which they're used. Uh, timing. Uh, so many things uh, roll back to, to a time factor. Um, the, the transport I was using earlier was pulling Dropbox every nine seconds. It's kind of an odd number, uh, intentionally. Uh, other applications that use Dropbox will pull at different uh, intervals, or they won't pull at all. They'll use some kind of push mechanism. So it's a good way to, to discriminate between things. Um, and then, like I said earlier, the, the ordering can, can be uh, unique as well. Uh, payload patterns. So I am using base 64 text or just raw, uh, random looking bytes, and I'm using file names that, that look like UUID values. So that's that's a pattern that you can look for um, that may be very different from the way that other applications use the same service. And, you know, in, in more complicated formats like JPEG or MP3, um, you should look in the metadata fields because that's, that's where I'm stuffing a lot of these, these messages within those, those fields. And 10, uh, general behavior. So just one example here. This, this is kind of a catch-all, but, um, so you got, okay, you got, you got WebEx meetings scheduled for 2 p.m. on Fridays, right? You got this WebEx chat room or conference room, but then you, you look at your network and someone's sending WebEx, WebEx chats to this uh, room all throughout the, the week, so that might be something that, that should arouse suspicion because you understand how the application is used in a, in a broad sense and uh, this is a deviation from it. So with, with uh, Dropbox, in particular, we go back to the list of 10 things or so and you know most of those things that I just mentioned are are ways that we can build um, detections. Uh, wait, there's more. Uh, so I was thinking about how to how to make this a little bit easier. Um, how how do we take take this these concepts and apply them to the real world for detection? I'm not an expert on detection, but uh, I think unit testing uh, may be a way to start looking at some of these things. So what I have also done is started working on a, a, a little tool that uses these transports to spoof command and control connections to various services and then spit out a report that says, here's the time stamps when these things occurred and here's the 10 things that you should be able to pull out of your, um, pull out of your logs. So that's uh, that's a work in progress. Hopefully that'll be uh, posted in the next week or two. We'll see. Um, looks like I got about one minute left, so um, I got time for maybe one question. Yeah. Sure. So the question was. Have I run across any organizations that force me to use more sophisticated techniques like this? And the answer is yes, sort of. Um, it's actually started, a, I started on this path maybe two years ago when I was doing a test for an organization and I could not get any of my HTTP uh, connections for com different command and control tools to, to get out of their network for, for various reasons. And I, I banged my head against the wall for a couple of days and what frustrated me the most was the fact that I was just able to log in to share file and upload and download any kind of files throughout this time. So I started trying to figure out how I could use that to to bypass. I don't know if it was if they forced me because their controls were so great or that I was just 